I used to wear sensible shoes and pantyhose and dark blue suits a lot like this. Um, I used to be a corporate lawyer. Um, my area of specialty was investment advisor regulation. And I used to hang out with a lot of people who looked like this. And we used to talk about exciting things like soft dollars, um, wrap fees, trade allocations. And um, I was really bored, really bored. And I was looking for some kind of inspiration. Um, I felt like I was in this sort of self-inflicted silo. And I looked across, and I saw other silos filled with different kinds of people. And I just had this weird feeling that if I could just get inside and visit some of those people in their silos, that I would somehow get this inspiration that I was yearning for. Um, I've always known that you know, whenever I hung out with different kinds of people or had different perspectives, that it always sort of helped me see the world in, the, in a different way and helped me solve problems differently. Um, when I was in law school, uh, my friends called me the study club slut. That's because I was in lots of study clubs, because I wanted to hear what everybody had to say. And everybody else was just in one boring study club. Um, so you know, af um, after a couple years of practicing law, I, I decided I'm going to break out of this silo somehow. And I knew a couple artsy people. And so I invited them over to my house for a salon. I decided that I was going to be this sort of modern day Gertrude Stein. And I would have artsy people in my living room, and we'd talk about interesting, fun things and drink wine. And, um, and that's what happened. We, we started talking about art, but then we'd talk about life and ideas and everything. It was amazing. And the um, salons kept growing. Um, I, started having, I started having to keep a waiting list, because my living room was only so big. And people like computer programmers and technology geeks and consultants started coming to the salons. And I thought, this is bizarre. Like, There's all these people who are, who are interested in kind of the same things I was interested in, in connecting with different people. Um, so I decided I was going to go big. Um, I found a raw retail space on 14th Street. Um, it, w it used to be an auto showroom, so it was quite large. And I convinced the landlord that you know, he should give the space to me for free, because I was going to bring all these people to his space and maybe he could rent it out to somebody. And you know, what, you know, what he didn't know is I didn't actually know what I was doing, and I had no idea anybody would even want to come to something like this. But um, he, he gave me the space. It was, really, it was really raw. The floor was concrete. It was uneven. Um, there, was, there, was, there were only two outlets that we plugged in six projectors and, and entire band's equipment into. There was no bathroom. We didn't have a permit at all to use it. Um, but we filled it with video art, um, an experimental band, a music band, and performance art. Um, this is a picture of me participating in one of the performance art pieces. Um, this man is giving me a haircut. Um, and he's a performance artist, but he told me that he was also a hairdresser by day for his, his day job. Um, hundreds of people came to this event. And I was shocked. So I tried it again. Um, and this time, I thought I'd change it up a little. I thought, Let's see if somebody would pay $10 to come to something like this. And so I found another space. It was uh, an, uh, an old break shop that had just closed. And there were oil stains still on the floor, on the concrete floor. The tools were still hanging on the walls. And we filled it with art, music, a bar, of course. And we sent out emails to our circle of friends. This was before social media really started taking off. And again, hundreds of people came. And they all paid money to come into this event. Um, I, I was astounded. And it made me realize that like, there are a lot of people out there just like me, trapped in their little silo, who are just yearning, hungering for different kinds of unconventional experiences where they could meet different people and see new things. Um, I started blogging at the time as well, because I wanted to show people where these things were happening. And I, would, you know, I, I tried to cover a lot of the art scene. But I was really focusing on sort of the emerging DIY undergroundish scene. And you know, because I felt like that's where you find sort of the more interesting people or the more inter interesting intersections. And uh, the blog started getting more traffic. And I started to realize, like, wow, like, it's not just my friends and family who are reading this thing. Like, people I don't even know are looking at it. So that was about the time I decided to quit being a lawyer and really go for it. And I started a small business, which I called the Pink Line Project. 
I turned the blog into a uh, web-based calendar, and it, the, it, it's a comprehensive calendar of all things cool and arty in Washington, D.C. And um, it's, it now generates revenue from the ad sales. So that, that, all, that just amazed me that people would pay to be on this website. I, I, I continued to do these big events where you know, we'd find raw spaces and, and activate them with arts and music. But I also started doing panel discussions, listening parties. I helped with a couple community-based um, festivals. My, my goal was to not, for you, for, 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 for Washington, D.C., to not have any excuse to have access to the arts. There was going to be something for everybody. And I kind of exhausted myself doing that. Um, but it, it was pretty, it was, it was, again, I was just amazed at every step of the way. Um, a couple years after doing Pink Line Project, I um, was invited to participate in the creative economy study that our city did, the one that Harry Trigunning men mentioned this morning. And that led to the first Temporium Project, um, which was on H Street. And um, this is the building that the Temporium was in. Um, it was an old abandoned kiosk, uh, library kiosk, that we turned into a, a little retail store, a little fashion retail store. And I gotta say, this was one of my favorite projects that Pinkline Project has ever done because what it did was it brought together so many different stakeholders in the, who had an interest in the creative economy and brought them together to make this Temporium a huge success. And I felt like Pink Line Project was at that intersection, was the connecting force between all these stakeholders. The local government provided some seed money to get the Temporium started, and they also gave us the space which they owned. Um, several businesses along H Street gave discounts to our customers. Um, several small businesses helped support our events. iStrategy Labs was a sponsor of our opening reception. And artists came and transformed the space into this amazing, sort of inspiring space. Um, one of the artists, Billy Colbert, turned some of the walls, he, he created walls out of fire hoses and out of burlap bags. It was just so creative and inspiring. And thousands of people came um, to shop there, and the vendors who displayed their goods there earned thousands of dollars. And it was truly a, a great example of how so many people could come together, connect together, to create something great. So the Pink Line Project, I feel like, had a great start because it, it, the timing was so good. Um, it was just as social media was taking off. And social media allowed us to really um, reach out to so many different audiences very efficiently. But at the same time, social media, though it gives you the illusion of, being, of giving more connectedness, I think that people were feeling less connected because of social media. And so they were looking for that connectedness that I think Pink Line Project was giving them, was giving them the opportunity to find. Um, the Pink Line Project, unlike the, the orange line or the red line, which just goes from point A to point B, the pink, line, the pink line actually connects it all together. And it brings people together across social spectrums and across industries um, in, in, this, in this circular fashion. Around the same time, um, David and I were having a lot of really intense discussions about art, artists, and business people trapped inside their silos. And we knew that those two worlds could really benefit each other. And there's lots of studies to show that they can benefit each other. But we couldn't, we wondered, like, how do they, how do they talk to each other? They rarely do. And, you know, we, we weren't trying to, we didn't want artists to become business people. We didn't want business people to become artists. All we wanted them to do was to actually get in the same room together and talk to each other and figure out a way to learn from each other. <laughs> Thanks, Philippa. And I think the Pink Line Project is definitely a great example of creative entrepreneurship here in Washington, D.C. And uh, like you mentioned, it was through those original conversations that I really started to think more and more about the intersection of these two different worlds, art and business. Um, I actually believe now that these worlds don't even just have the potential to overlap in new ways but that each world actually holds the key to each other's success. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. When I was about 19 years old, I decided I wanted to follow the art path. And like many of us, we reach a certain decision point 
where we have to decide, are we going to follow our passion, or are we going to follow our career? I set out to write a novel, and I spent the next 10 years working on that. I majored in English, studied creative writing, um, wrote almost every single day, hung out with other writers. And after those 10 years, I ended up with a 500-page manuscript sitting on my desk, and I had no idea how to bring that product to the marketplace. I had no idea how to shape it into something commercial. And I realized that there was a whole world of business skills that I had never gathered while I was immersed in the creative process. I made a decision to jump ship completely and join the consulting world, the business consulting world. And the work I do now is literally help teach executives how to think more creatively about business, how to approach business in entirely new ways. And when I joined this different, completely different world, I realized that my new colleagues had skills that would have been so helpful to me while I'd been working on my book, would have been so helpful to many other artists who are really looking for a way to make a living doing what they love. As Philippa mentioned, there's been some new forces that have brought art and business together in new ways, social media and all the related technologies. But you would think that there would be more entrepreneurs. You all have heard today from a number of different um, creative entrepreneurs here in Washington, DC, but why aren't there more? It was that question that really started me thinking about whether or not there are any kind of opposing forces that are actually stifling the emergence of more entrepreneurship. And in doing some of the, some of the research that I was doing for work and in talking to different artists, I came across two things that I think are really interesting. One has to do with the art world, and one has to do with the business world. When you look at the art world, I'll be the first to admit that I was very reluctant to compromise creative integrity for the sake of commercialism. And I talked to a lot of other artists that struggle with the same thing. You want to make a living, you want to get your product to an audience, yet at the same time, you don't want to make any compromises to that creative integrity. There are also just a ton of business skills that I know I didn't have, and a lot of artists I know maybe you know, learned a little bit along the way, but just so many things that would be helpful in terms of pricing your art, reaching new audiences, um, business models. These are all just things that I never even explored. So there's this kind of uneasiness with, um, with the business side that I think a lot of artists have. Now over on the business side, the opposing force or that's stifling some entrepreneurship is a little bit different. Uh, and you've really got to scratch the surface a little bit more to really understand it. Because you can ask 150 CEOs around the world across 33 different industries in the middle of a global recession. IBM actually did this in 2010. You can ask them what they want, and they will say, more than anything else, creativity. Creativity. Yet those very same businesses actually struggle to cultivate creativity in the workforce. They actually struggle to deliver innovation. And creativity is the ingredient for innovation. And innovation is really what determines success or failure in the marketplace. So why do they struggle? If they espouse creativity as this goal, why is it so hard to actually be creative in the business world? You know, there's some really new, interesting research coming out of Cornell that shows that people in the business world are trained to minimize risk. And that's why they'll actually choose the practical over the creative option almost any day of the week. Because by nature, something that's creative is new and therefore uncertain. So it's that unpredictability of creativity, which is why you don't see it as much uh, in the marketplace. Once we really understand how to leverage these two opposing forces and turn them into opportunities, I think it's going to open up a completely new world. I think of this space as called the entrepreneurial space, or e-space as I've termed it. This is essentially where all of us in the room want to be, or at least are curious of. 
This is the space where you get to make a living doing what you love. What is it? This is basically where new forces create new opportunities to bring new products, new services, new experiences to new audiences. The name of the game, obviously, is new. So the only thing you have to do to get into this entrepreneurial space is create. The great thing about it is that unlike the business world or the established business world, where you've got 100 people fighting for the same office cube, here it's limitless. It's a boundless space because by nature, you're creating something that didn't exist before. Philip and I, in our conversations, like when we were thinking about the intersection of art and business and really um, sparking more entrepreneurship, we stumbled upon this idea of something that I'm calling AB squared. A stands for art, B stands for business. And when you combine them, really amplify the overall impact. It's a quick example. There was a company back in the uh, late 1990s, a computer company. And they were about to launch a new computer, and they were struggling to figure out exactly you know, what colors it should be. Um, and you know, it probably wrestled with, should it be black, should it be gray? But instead, they took a trip to a jelly bean factory and looked at the pinks, the blues, the whites, and felt really inspired about just kind of the boldness of these colors and decided to use those colors for their products. That company, of course, is Apple. And just think about how much those bold colors actually now create personality and passion behind all of their products. This is just a way of saying this is a business that looked at jelly beans in a completely artistic way to think about how color could totally change the game for a regular product. How do you actually do AB squared? Like Philip and I talk about it all the time. Like, how do you actually do this on a day-to-day -day basis, though? One thing that we've discussed is if you're in the arts, the next time you're trying to solve a problem or create a new opportunity, to literally seek out somebody from the business world, not just in your personal network, but somebody you don't even know, and ask them, what would you do in this situation? What, were you, what would you do if you were me? Same thing if you're from the business world. Literally reaching out to an artist that you don't even know and ask them, how would you solve this business problem? Because it's that cross-pollination where all sorts of new ideas happen. If you're thinking, well, how do I meet somebody outside of my circle, or I don't know, that feels kind of weird, the bottom line is, if it feels uncomfortable and uneasy, you're probably doing something right. Because that means you're getting out of your comfort zone breaking down those silos that Philippa talked about that I know for me and for a lot of other artists I've talked to keep the worlds apart. Art and business, of course, are just two of myriad worlds that can be brought together in new ways, though. We're seeing really interesting things between art and technology. I've heard some speakers talk about that today. Um, art and government, for example, with uh, the Temporium. Um, but there are tons more. What about art and science? What about completely different combinations? They're all out there waiting to be discovered. All of us have some sort of creative impulse within us, but it's really figuring out like what unique gifts and strengths we bring to the table, what worlds we can combine in new ways in order to step into this entrepreneurial space and make a living doing what we love. So, <laughs> so, so you know how you go to conferences and you get all inspired and then kind of peters out? Well, we want to get started today. We um, want to keep this conversation going, and so we've started a Twitter hashtag called hash eSpace. And We'd like you to post your challenges that you may have as you're thinking about being an entrepreneur or if you have some opportunities that you'd like to create or help others with. And we'd hope that you'll participate in this online forum as a way to spark more creative entrepreneurship in Washington. Thank you. Thank you.